Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Travel in the Far East introduces one to many fascinating places. None more glamorous or exotic than Singapore. I remember thinking as I glimpsed its teeming wharves and tortuous alleys and sensed its age and oriental secrecy, what an ideal background it would be for a mystery. Tonight I seem to be rewarded, as indeed you are as well, with the first screenplay to use present-day Singapore as its locale. And our stars are straight from the cast of the Universal International Picture Singapore, Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner. No one who has ever visited the Far East, as Mrs. Keeley and I did, could possibly forget the internationally famous Raffles Hotel, a crossroads of the world. And if my memory serves me right, Lux Soap was among the welcome modern touches there as it is right here in Hollywood. In fact, my good friend, Hernando Courtright, president of the Beverly Hills Hotel, host to so many famous screen stars and celebrities, assures me that Lux Soap is part of every room's hospitable appointments, a friendly, thoughtful way of saying welcome to a guest. From Hollywood to Singapore, we bring you now our first act, starring Fred McMurray as Matt Gordon, and Ava Gardner as Linda Graham. Our theater lights are dimmed as the curtain rises. At the airport in Singapore, there's a modest group of officers of the British government. Among them, an office labeled Customs Division. Welcome back to Singapore, Mr. Gordon. Hello, Inspector. Won't you sit down? Well, all this attention, I'm overcome. So am I. I thought these old eyes were failing me when I saw your name on the passenger list. You know, Mr. Hewitt, I hoped you would have forgotten I ever existed. But how could I? How is the pearl business these days? Pearl business? You still don't believe me, do you? I've told you a dozen times my schooner carried nothing but copra. Why'd you come back, Gordon? Leave something behind? No, I just wanted to see what Singapore looked like again. Find out what the war did to it. I always loved Singapore. I have a little report on you here. Oh? Routine, I trust. More or less. Matthew Gordon, Lieutenant United States Naval Reserve, commanded motor torpedo boat, Solomon Islands, New Guinea. Silver Star, Battle of Surigao Straits. Congratulations. Thank you. You must have been very useful. You know those waters like a native. Oh, uh, your passport? Ah. Here you are. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, where did you find those oyster beds? Off La Buan, wasn't it? <laughs> Copra, Mr. Hewitt. The dried kernel of the coconut. Copra. Going to buy another schooner? No. Well, in case you change your mind. Here. Summary of regulations, Malay State, Section 211. Now, let me quote just one paragraph. Any person or persons convicted of removing pearls at sea and taking such illegal pearls into or out of a British colony shall be subject to a minimum of ten years' imprisonment. Ten years, huh? Before the war, it was only eight. But I guess everything's gone up, huh? I see a couple of other Americans were on your plane, a Mr. and Mrs. Bellows. Mm. Tourists. Of course. Like yourself. Of course. Well, Mr. Hewitt, if you should, you should want me for anything, I'm staying at the same hotel I was before the war. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, oh, how good to see you again. I think of you many times, Mr. Gordon. It's good to see you, Catum. You uh, had a rugged time, huh? I was in a concentration camp. That's past. Yeah. How are you fixed for our accommodations, Catum? For you, there is always room at this hotel. Uh-huh. 
Any chance of getting that suite I used to have? 202, wasn't it? Yes, quite a memory. I'm terribly sorry. 202 has been already reserved for a Mr. and Mrs. Bellows. I could put you right next to them, though. Suite 200. Right next door, huh? That'll be fine, Kadem. Oh, uh, will you have my bag sent up? I think I'll drop in the cafe. Yes, yes, Mr. Gordon. I can give you a table at the window, sir. No, this one will do. Bring me a gin sling, will you, please? Uh, uh, yes, sir. It's been five long years since I've been here, but nothing really has changed. Things I'd hoped I'd forgotten, I, I can't forget. It almost seems that I returned to Singapore just to see this bar again, this table again. It had been our table, Linda's and mine. Linda. Linda Graham. We'd known each other only a short time. And then the war came along, and there I was at the dock saying goodbye to her. But why must I go, Matt? Why can't I stay here with you? Darling, we've been through all that. There's a war on. This is the last ship out of Singapore. But we may never see each other again. Oh, Missy Graham! Missy Graham! Oh, there's Ming Ling. She made it. Oh, you did get through. Nobody keep me from saying goodbye to Missy. Oh, I wish I could take you with me. Missy's so kind. Maybe I'll come back after the war, Ming Ling. If I do, I I'll find you. Here, take this. Missy's bracelet? Yes, my bracelet. I want you to have it. Thank you. Goodbye, Missy. I won't go, Matt. I won't. You've got to go, Linda. Just, just don't forget me. Whatever happens to either of us, I'll find you, Matt. Nothing's going to happen, darling. Now, go up that gangplank. Goodbye, darling. I stood there watching Linda disappear in the crowded deck. I'd never felt so alone in my life. And then suddenly she was running down the gangplank and into my arms. I couldn't let her go again. I held her there as the hawsers slipped from the pilings, and the ship that would have taken her to safety slowly headed toward sea. Twenty minutes later, we were here, here at this table, Linda and I. I asked the waiter for a telephone. Hello? Give me the desk, please. Oh, Kadem, this is Matt Gordon. Kadem, I'd like a room for a lady. Huh? Well, only for a day or so, and then... Then we'll both be in suite 202. <laughs> no, it's all right, Kadem. Don't worry. We're going to get married. Oh, thank you, Kadem. He says he hopes we'll be happy. He should know how happy. Is that the way you propose? Yeah. I accept. Oh, darling, I love you so much. Linda, you know what you're doing. You're sure. Well, there's only one thing I regret. You see... Someone's on that ship out there that I, I miss terribly. Who? The steward who has my luggage. Uh -huh. All my alluring clothes. Well, tomorrow you can buy all the clothes you want. And who are you? A rich man? I'm a pirate. In my rooms upstairs, there's a buried treasure. Buried? In the floor? Oh, no. That'd be too easy. It's in the ceiling. And if nobody else finds it, we'll have a fortune. <laughs> The next morning, Linda and I went to a mission. We'd be married then and there. The minister's wife was listening to a radio in the next room. We wish room. to arrange for a wedding. Well, first, your names and date and place of birth. Matthew Gordon, April 26, 1910, Brooklyn. Let me see. That's in New York, isn't it? Since when? No. no uh, yes, sir, that's in New York. And you, young lady? Linda Graham, September 11th, 1919, Rochester, New York. Linda, G-R-A-H-A-M. H-A-M-E. There's an E on the end. There's an E on the end? Yes, darling. Well, what do you know? You haven't known each other very long? Oh, nine days. Well, now, if you'll each sign here, please. You understand this is just the notice of intention to wed. You'll have to wait three weeks for the bands to be posted. Three weeks? Well, it'll give you time to get better acquainted. Yeah, but we... Excuse me, yes? The radio. They just said a very important announcement is coming. Listen. They said everyone should stand by. Attention, please. Attention. Penang has just been bombed by two flights of Japanese aircraft. Japanese ground forces have invaded the northern part of the peninsula. All military personnel and local defense corps are ordered to report to stations at once. I will repeat. Turn it off, Penang. Penang has oh, just Thomas, been... what are we going to do? Make the best of it, Emily. 
Under the circumstances, sir, wouldn't it be possible for us to be married sooner? Couldn't you forget the regulations just for uh, once? Perhaps. Uh, be here Wednesday night. I'll try to arrange for a special license by then. Wednesday. I can't promise to have it that early, Mr. Gordon, but bring two witnesses and a ring just in case. Four more days to wait. Four more days. On Christmas Eve, they put up a tree in the hotel lobby. There was a tinsel star on the top of the tree with the words, Peace on Earth. Let's get our presents, Matt. We can open them down here under the tree. Oh, no, there are too many people here. All right. Then I'll run up to your room, darling. I'll join you there in a minute. Linda had just come into my room when I became aware of a vaguely familiar scent, a special brand of toilet water. I went out to the balcony. No. No, let go of me. I knew I smelled a rat. You're tearing my shirt. It's, it's real silk. You wear too much perfume, Sasha. I always told you that. <coughs> Look what you've done. Material like this, it, it's irreplaceable. I... Oh? Good evening, mademoiselle. Good evening. What were you doing here, Sasha? Enjoying the view from your balcony. A perfect place to watch the Japanese attack Singapore. I'll try not to be here when they do. You're sailing off in your schooner? Looks like I'll have to, doesn't it? I hope you won't leave without seeing Mr. Moribus. That's why I came, to tell you he still wants to see you. Tell him I won't have the time. He'll be very disappointed. Well, my apologies for having interrupted such a charming tete-a-tete. -tete. Merry Christmas. And who is that? Sasha? Oh, he's part of the charm of Singapore. Who is he, Matt? Oh, I'll tell you about him sometime. And who is Mr. Moribus? Moribus? He's, uh, he's Santa Claus. <laughs> All right, keep your old secrets. Here, your Christmas present from me to you. Hey. You know what it is? Yeah, it's Burmese, isn't it? A Burmese ring. The Minla Talisman. Mm-hmm. Means one life, one love. One life, one love. Thanks, darling. Well, here's your present. Come on, open it up. You'll have to excuse the wrapping. I tried to get some Christmas paper, oh, but they... Oh, Matt! Oh, they're gorgeous. Huh. But they must have cost a fortune. I've never seen such pearls. You know how I got them? One day I was hungry, so I ordered some oysters. A hundred oysters. I was pretty hungry. And when I opened them up, what do you think I found? In each one, a little pearl. Wasn't that lucky? Mm -hmm. You fish for the oysters from your schooner. <laughs> You're learning, darling. You used to say boat. The next day was more than Christmas to Linda and me. It was our wedding day. The war news was getting worse, but we had happier things to think about. We found Ming Ling, the little native girl who'd been Linda's housemaid. She would be one of our witnesses. And the other be Sabar, the mate of my schooner. Late that afternoon, Linda and I wandered into the hotel bar. Waiting for us at this same table was an official of the British government, Mr. Hewitt of the Customs Division. I hope you'll forgive me. You see, I'm not here just to wish you to a Merry Christmas. No, I'm disappointed. I came to inquire about that string of pearls you're wearing, Miss Graham. What about them, Mr. Hewitt? A few weeks ago, you came to Singapore. Suddenly, we find you spending most of your time with Mr. Gordon. And equally suddenly, you appear with this remarkable necklace. What shall I call it? An arresting coincidence? Very arresting. You're implying that Matt stole these pearls? The word is smuggled, Miss Graham. I... I bought that necklace in America, in New York. May I ask where? You may. It's Breton Langhorns. Then you'll forgive me if I send a cable to confirm that. Oh, no, I won't. But don't let that stop you. I hope you understand my position, Miss Graham. We have to try to clean things up, you know, with the Japanese practically at our gates. Well, I'll try to get a cable through. You'll hear from me, Miss Graham, with an apology or perhaps to confiscate that necklace. You perform beautifully, darling. Thanks. Matt, what's this all about? You was right, of course. I smuggled the pearls. Well, now that the necklace is mine, can I do what I want with it? Sure. Then I'll give it to Hewitt, so he won't bother us anymore. Oh, that won't stop him. Well, what else does he want? A little bag of loose pearls worth a quarter of a million dollars. Where are they? In your room? <laughs> That's what Hewitt would like to find out. Just like Sasha tried to find out last night. Can't you sell them without smuggling them? Sure, for about a fourth as much. Does that make it worth the danger? Well, maybe that's what I've liked about it. 
Have you planned to do that all your life, darling? I don't know. Plans change, Linda. Like I never planned to get married, but I'll be married in four hours. Come on, let's get down to the schooner. I want to make sure we get out of here tonight. Every, everything was set aboard the schooner. Then we picked up Ming Ling and Sabar. We'd take them back to the hotel with us. With the Japs closing in, we'd knew, we knew we'd have to stick close together. But when we were near the hotel, a military guard stopped us. Sorry, sir, you can't go any further. What's going on? We were just going to the hotel. The government has just taken over the hotel, sir. It's a military base. Oh, but we live there all our... Better see the sergeant, sir. He may be able to help. I told Linda to go on to the mission with Sabar and Ming Ling to wait for me there. I know I shouldn't have left her. But the pearls, I'd run so much risk to get them and to keep them. I, I had to get back to my rooms in that hotel. It took me a half an hour to get a pass. By then, enemy planes were already over the city. But I didn't turn back. The pearls had become an obsession. I, I had to have them. Come in. I'm Matt Gordon. Oh, yes, Mr. Gordon. I understand these rooms belong to you. Well, we've moved your things to the corner there. Help yourself. No. Well, it's, it's all right. I'll, uh, I'll come back later. I'll get them later. It'll be very likely much later, if there's anything left at all. There was nothing I could do, not with a British major and four men in the room. I ran most of the way to the mission. The bombing had started and Singapore was in a panic. And then I saw it. The mission, what was left of it, burning like a torch. And huddled in the gutter, Ming Ling and Sabah. <laughs> Ming Ling. Where is she, Ming Ling? Where is she? Sabah. It's a claim. Still, still in that one. In there? No, not one. Come back. Come back. <laughs> Maybe I would have found her, I don't know. A wall gave way and I, I didn't move fast enough. When I came to, I was in the street. Sabah had dragged me out. We searched for hours everywhere until there was no hope left. When we finally went to the schooner, I, I knew Linda was dead. During the night, we left Singapore with as many refugees as we could carry. I never meant to come back again. But now, five years later, I am back. But not for memories. A quarter of a million dollars worth of pearls would bring anyone back. I hate to disturb your reverie, Mr. Gordon. Oh. Well, Sasha. Nice to have you back in Singapore again. That's funny. That's what Hewitt told me. And that is what Mr. Moribus would tell you, too. Oh, is he still around? Oh, yes. I've got nothing more of us once. But he has something that you may want. Oh? Something that belongs to you, Mr. Gordon. What is it? How should I know? Okay. Tell your boss I'll drop around tonight. In a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Singapore. Meanwhile, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's on your list tonight, Libby? Two brand new hits, Mr. Keeley. The one I'd like to talk about first is the Enterprise Productions picture, Body and Soul. In which John Garfield plays the role of a prize fighter. Yes. The prize fight scene at the end is really terrific. I know I left the preview completely exhausted just from watching well, it. John takes a lot of punishment in Body and Soul. But he certainly has an incentive with lovely Lily Palmer as the heroine. And sultry red-haired Hazel Brooks as the other woman. Hazel Brooks plays the torch singer and wears some gowns that can only be described as, well, exotic. Have you seen her, Mr. Kennedy? I have, Libby. And uh, I'd say exotic is the word for Hazel, too. And how would you describe that smooth, luxe complexion of hers, John? Oh, that's easy. Glamorous, uh, gorgeous... Exotic. <laughs> Which reminds me, Libby, what's that other brand new hit you said you had on your list? It's the one screen stars are talking about. It's a new version of Hollywood's own beauty soap. The big new bath size cake. With that same delightful Lux soap fragrance. Lots and lots of that wonderful creamy lather. In a handsome, larger cake. It's exotic. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be our favorite word tonight, Libby. 
Well, doesn't it help describe our exciting new beauty product? You're right. That fragrant satin smooth cake has glamour. Screen stars love it. Hazel Brooks told me how much she enjoys her daily beauty bath with his new luxury cake. Says her Lux soap bath makes her feel like new after a long day on the set. And now, the new bath size Lux toilet soap is available to women everywhere. Why not ask for it when you shop tomorrow? It's in the familiar sampler wrapper, and it's the same fine quality Lux toilet soap you've always used. Only the size is different. And by the way, the men in your family will be keen about this new bath cake, too. We return you now to William Keeley. Curtain time for the second act of Singapore, starring Fred McMurray as Matt Gordon and Ava Gardner as Linda Graham. It's a few minutes later. In an antique shop on a fashionable street, the man called Sasha has a report for Mr. Maribus. Gordon will see you tonight, Mr. Maribus. Good. What else? Mr. Hewitt spoke to Gordon at the airport. Gordon then came to the hotel, asked for his old suite of rooms, but could not get them. Oh. They had been rented. Mr. and Mrs. Gerald Bellows, American tourists. Gordon got the suite right next door. Mm, well, I am right. The pearls are still in Singapore. In his old rooms in that hotel. Uh, this Mr. and Mrs. Bellows. Gordon knows them. He was talking to them at the airport when Hewitt sent for him. Tourists, sir. My instinct tells me something, Sasha. Mr. Gordon is going to be very kind to Mr. and Mrs. Bellows. Why, Mr. Gordon! Gerald! Gerald, look who's here, Mr. Gordon. I just thought I'd stop by and see how you're getting along, Mrs. Bellows. I know what it is to be a stranger in the Orient. Dad, blessed bathtub. Didn't they ever hear of American plumbing? Well, hello, Mr. Gordon. Say, you stopping here, too? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm right next door. But how lovely. Are your rooms comfortable? Oh, we think they're just Outside charming. Outside of the bathtub, I mean. <laughs> the reason I asked is that I lived in these rooms before the war. They uh, hold a lot of memories for me. They're pretty much the same as they were. That is, uh, they still could use a few coats of paint. And how? Take a look at that ceiling. You see those cracks? Oh, they're probably due to the bombings during the war. Well, what about that electric fan on the ceiling there? That could cause vibrations. Oh, yes, you know? I suppose it could, but it'd be pretty warm without a fan, though. Well, I think it's all very quaint, and we leave the fan alone, Gerald. Well, if there's anything I can do, I... Oh, there's that... one thing you can do. Could you tell us where that temple is in the Southbridge Road? Oh, gladly. They say it's a must for every tourist. Oh, I should say it is. There, you see, Gerald? We'll go there tomorrow. I'd be happy to take you, if you oh, like. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, how about you having dinner with us tonight, hmm? We'd sure like to have you, Mr. Gordon. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm afraid tonight I'll... Uh... I'll be pretty busy. Oh, dear. Mr. Gordon, come in, my friend. Come in. Well, this is indeed an honor. Your boy, Sasha, tells me you're holding something for me. What is it, Mr. Morbus? Oh, we'll get to that. Uh, you're looking very well. Uh, how was the war? Very absorbing. How was yours? Oh, not too bad. I, I rather like several times. They they keep the police occupied. <laughs> Looks like you're back in business. But I'm not. I came to Singapore for sentimental reasons only. You came back to get a quarter of a million dollars worth of pearls. Uh -huh. I did? Tell me more, Mr. Morbus. In 1941, you were at sea for five months. You can bring up a lot of pearls in five months. But strangely, when you left Singapore, you took no pearls with you. Is that so? Yes, that is so. Among the refugees you so heroically evacuated was an acquaintance of mine. He assures me there were no pearls aboard your schooner. So? Well, pearls are very scarce. And I'm willing to buy yours at a price. But I do mean to have them. There aren't any pearls, Mr. Morabus. I traded only in copra. I have a sample of your copra, Mr. Gordon, here in my desk. Do you remember this necklace of beautifully matched copra? Where did you get that? It was found among the debris of a bombed-out mission. 
I would gladly give you this necklace when you sell me the other pearls I know you have hidden. No deal. And stop bothering me. I'm not going to be here long, and I quit being sociable. Good night, Mr. Morrison. You heard him, Sasha. Yes. He does not want to be sociable. But we do. Watch him closely. Well, Mr. Bellows, I've shown you the oriental aspect of Singapore. Now, here is what Western civilization has accomplished. A nightclub, just like at home. Well, this is more like it. Yes, sir. This I think I'm going to like. <laughs> oh, very well, Gerald. But it's no different than Minneapolis. That's just what I mean. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, table for three, right near the dance floor. Uh, this way, please. Oh, don't worry, Mrs. Bellows. We don't have to stay long. There's a Chinese theater down the street. Maybe we can... No. What's the matter? I just saw some... Would you excuse me, please? Well, what came over him? I don't know. Oh, come on, Gerald. You probably just recognized someone. Linda. Linda. Oh, are you speaking to me? You don't know me? I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I don't. I think you're confusing my wife with someone else. Your wife? Yes, I... Uh... I guess I am confused. I, I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. Captain. Yes, sir? That lady in the white dress. Can you tell me the name of the gentleman who's with her? That's Mr. Michael Van Leiden, sir. He owns a plantation at Middang. Thank you. Is Mrs. Van Leiden home? Your name, sir? Matt Gordon. I'm an old friend of hers. If you'll wait in there, sir, I'll announce you. Mr. Gordon, won't you come in? Linda. Why, you're the man who spoke to me last night. Linda, look. There's no one around now. What's the matter? What's happened to you? Why don't you want to know me? But you must be mistaken. My name isn't Linda. Linda Graham with an E on the end. Doesn't that sound familiar? I'm afraid it doesn't. We met here in Singapore five years ago. You had a servant named Ming Ling. Ming Ling? You've forgotten her too, huh? And I suppose you don't remember Commissioner Hewitt either. Yeah, I'm coming along, darling. We're waiting for you to play a double. So... Oh, I beg your pardon. This is Mr. Gordon, dear. My husband, Mr. Van Leiden. We uh, sort of met last night, didn't we? Mr. Gordon insists that I'm someone else. A uh, Miss Graham. Or... Uh, or is it Mrs.? Obviously a case of mistaken identity. But he said um, that... May I speak to you for a moment? Yes, of course. Will you excuse us, Mr. Gordon? I'd like to see you, though, before you leave. Hmm? I'll wait on the veranda. Thank you. Michael. We... We knew something like this might happen, didn't we, darling? Yes, but... But now that it has happened, it's such a shock, Michael. Names. People. And not being able to remember. Darling, have you been happy with me? Yes, you know that. Then doesn't that answer everything? We don't have to know about the past. Would it make any difference to you? Oh, it might make a lot of difference. To both of us. I rather expected this visit from Mr. Gordon. I thought I'd try to find out who he is. I did. From the police. They're very interested in him. Do you trust me, Anne? Yes, more than myself. Then let me handle this alone. Sorry to keep her waiting, Mr. Gordon. My wife sends her apologies. That's understandable. You knew her before the war? Yes, I knew her. And you're still concerned about her? Certainly I'm concerned about her. What's wrong with her? Why doesn't she remember me? My wife remembers none of her past. She only remembers her life from the time she woke up in a hospital after an air raid. So, that's what happened. Yes. We met in a hospital. And then we were three years in a prison camp. We've built a whole new life. She's happy and I want her to remain that way. How can she be happy when she doesn't remember the greater part of her life? Maybe the best part. 
What kind of happiness is that? Mr. Gordon, I don't care to know about my wife's past. Maybe you don't, but I think it's up to her to decide which part of her life she wants to remember and what part she wants to forget. Anything else? No. Not for the moment, Mr. Van Leiden. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Van Leiden? Yes. Uh, this is police headquarters, Mrs. Van Leiden. You inquired several days ago about a native girl named Ming Ling. Oh, yes. You've located her? Uh, surprisingly enough, we have. Uh, she's married to a storekeeper in the native quarter. If you have a pencil, Mrs. Van Leiden, I can give you the address. Missy Graham! Oh, Missy Graham! I thought you were dead. You are Ming Ling. Ming Ling, yes, yes. Oh, so happy you come here. Have a chair, Missy. I make tea. No, wait. Ming Ling. You no remember, Missy? Look, on my arm, bracelet you give to me. Always wear it. Always. Oh, Missy Graham. Missy Graham. <laughs> I don't understand it, Mr. Moritz. I tell you, Gordon has made not the slightest effort to learn if the pearls are still in Suite 202 or not. You are too impatient, Sasha. Gordon is not impatient. For one thing, Mr. and Mrs. Bellows have those rooms now. And for another, he's smart enough to know that he is being watched by us and Mr. Hewitt. <laughs> as far as I can see, he's only interested in that lady who now calls herself Mrs. Van Leiden. Ah, that sentiment. The pearls are business. Nevertheless, he's bought another schooner. Is that also sentiment? That's what I intend to find out. Tell your friend to come in. Pepe, come in. Pepe and I used to work together, Mr. Moribus, before I joined you and Big Business. Pepe has had a conference with Mr. Gordon. Oh? What about Pepe? I'm a loyal man. Uh, what's in it for me if I talk? Double as much as if you don't. That's 200 American dollars. After you've shown me how disloyal you can be. Well, sir, I'm in the business of manufacturing official papers. Unofficially, of course. Uh, Mr. Gordon wants an American passport for a lady. Uh, the name is Graham. He wants to take her on a voyage. With or without her consent. Well, now. And, uh... When does this voyage take place? Mr. Gordon has to complete certain arrangements first. That's all I know. Give me the money, Sasha. Thank you, Mr. Mortimer. Now go. If you want to know anything else, Sasha knows where to find me. With or without her consent. Hmm. Interesting. Very. Tell me something, Sasha. Have you other friends in Singapore? Good friends like uh, Pepe. I think we can use one or two such friends. Now. And since they told me at the desk that you'd be back, Mr. Gordon, I decided to wait for you here in the bar. I hope you don't mind. You'll excuse me if I seem a little bewildered. After what's happened, I hardly expected you to be calling on me. Where's your husband? At the plantation. He doesn't know I'm meeting you. Oh. This may sound silly, but how did you happen to wait for me at this particular table? I don't know. Why do you ask? I... I just wondered. I... I came in town to see someone, a native girl named Ming Ling. You found her? Yes. That's why I'm here. Ming Ling also says that I'm Linda Graham. What else did she tell you? Everything. It was like... like hearing a story about someone I didn't know. Someone who's dead. I remembered nothing. All right. If Linda is dead to you, let her be dead. But we're alive, you and I. We're sitting here. The same hotel, same bar, the same table, just as it was five years ago. Can't you see that it doesn't make any difference if you remember or not? Linda, if I'd never known you, if I were seeing you today for the first time... I'd fall in love with you just as I did before. Can't you see that? And it's got to be the same with you. It is, isn't it? Answer me. There is no answer. 
There can't be. Because you're married. Because I know there's no happiness if it means hurting someone else. Didn't my husband tell you how we met? Yes. He said you were both interned. During the whole war. I was lonelier than anyone else. You see, I didn't even have memories. The present was completely empty, cut off from everything. And without Michael, there would have been no future. And you want me to keep out of it? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. I... I won't see you again. What are your plans? Whatever they were, they've changed in the last couple of minutes. Whatever they are, I wish you good luck. Thanks. I... I'd like to go now. There's just one more thing. This ring. I want to give it back to you. There's an inscription. One life. One love. Goodbye, Mr. Coyne. Goodbye. Mr. Gordon, I thought I heard you in the corridor. Oh, hello, Mrs. Bellows. Do come in, Mr. Gordon. We want to say goodbye. Oh, you're leaving? Mm -hmm. When? Hello, Mr. Gordon. When would you guess we'd be leaving? At a reasonable hour? Oh, no. 5 a.m., 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, would I like to meet the maniac who thinks up tourist schedules? How about a drink? No, thanks. I, uh, I've got to do some packing myself. Oh? You see, I'm leaving Singapore, too. We'll be on the same plane again. Well, what a wonderful coincidence. Yes, isn't it? Mr. Bellows, sir. Yes, Excuse me, sir, but besides seeing cars leaving in five minutes... Oh, thanks, son. Oh, you can come up later and get our luggage. It's all packed. Yes, sir. One last fling, huh? Another temple. Muriel just won't give up. It's got a gold-plated roof. Gold leaf, dear. I still say asbestos shingles are cheaper and better. You'll be back here for dinner? No such luck. This tour goes on half the night. Well, I'll see you at the airport, then. Have a good time. <laughs> What a nice young man. So friendly. Is service? Give me the desk, please. Hello? Oh, this is Matt Gordon, Caden. Yes, Mr. Gordon. Do you know if Mr. and Mrs. Bellows have left yet? Oh, yes, sir. The sightseeing car left about five minutes ago. Oh. Well, it's nothing important. I'll see them later. Thanks, Caden. Oh, no. It was nothing important at all. Just a quarter of a million dollars worth of pearls. The key to their room, suite 202. For five years, I've hung on to this key just to... Hey, wait a minute, sucker. The pearls are tucked away in that casing around the electric fan on the ceiling. Well, you take them off. But then what? What do you do with them? You hide them again. Where? Yeah. In their luggage. In Gerald Bellow's Gladstone bag. As simple as that. Yeah. Just as simple as that. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Hewitt. Hello, Caden. Mr. Gordon, do you know? Yes, sir. Should I announce you? Oh, no, no, no. I, uh, I want to make it a surprise visit. Sweet 200, isn't it? Yes, sir. Sweet 200. Hello, Mr. Gordon. Hello, Commissioner. Homesick for your old rooms? Oh, no, I was just saying goodbye to some American friends of mine. Just a social call. I'd like to meet those friends of yours. Well, they seem to have disappeared. Mr. Bellows? Yes, they, uh, they do seem to have disappeared. Come on, Gordon. Let's have the pearls, eh? Pearls? Mind if I search you? I know. Go right ahead. Excuse me. Yes? May we take the luggage now, sir? Oh, right, go ahead. It's all right with me. Uh, anything else, Commissioner? Yes. Suppose we have a little talk in your rooms. Fine. You can forget about the pearls for a moment. I hear you met the Van Lydens. That's right. She was here in the bar with you early this afternoon. Yeah. Did she seem all right when she left? Yes, certainly. Why? Because she never got home. What do you mean, she never got home? She's disappeared. I thought you might know something about it. No. No, I don't. Perhaps not. How did she leave here? In a taxi? I don't know. I stayed in the bar. Any idea? No. I don't like this, Gordon. If you find out anything, call my office. I don't like it either. 
Maybe I'll call you. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll be back with Act Three of Singapore. Our guest tonight is an interesting young lady with an interesting job. Let me introduce Miss Billy McKim. I let her tell you about the work she does. I'm with Universal International, Mr. Keeley, and my job is to escort important studio visitors who want to see pictures being made. Famous names are all part of the day's work to you, then. You might say so, Mr. Keeley, and I just love it. No matter how busy and important they are, people are always delighted to watch a story being filmed. That was especially true of the Universal International picture, The Exile. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. does some exciting fencing in that. Yes, Doug wrote and produced the picture, besides playing the leading role. Yes, and Douglas Fairbanks made full use of the opportunity to bring to the screen this romantic period of Holland's history. There's a lovely new blonde star, Paul Croce, in The Exile. And beautiful Maria Montez plays the role of the Countess. Visitors to the set were fascinated by her traveling bathtub. Oh, yes, that huge copper affair. The kind used by wealthy travelers of those times. The script called for Miss Montez to be immersed in it. And the top closed down, leaving just a place for her head. <laughs> well, that sounds highly uncomfortable. It was. But guess what Miss Montez did after the scene was over? I can't imagine. Took another bath in her dressing room. Another one? Yes. But what a difference. This time, she told me, it was a real 20th century luxury bath with her favorite beauty soap. I guess Mr. Kennedy wants to say something about that. I certainly do, because it was a very special beauty bath with the brand new bath size Lux toilet soap. Well, Mr. Kennedy, I visited all the dressing rooms at the studio, and the stars are certainly keen about the wonderful new bath size. I agree with them, too. That generous new case is so luxurious. Thank you, Miss Billy McKim. It's beauty news that the fragrant white soap nine out of ten screen stars use is now available in convenient bath size. Women everywhere who've tried it say... More of the rich, creamy Lux toilet soap lather. The delicate fragrance like a bouquet of fresh flowers. Such a joy to use. You'll agree when you try the new bath size Lux toilet soap. You'll say it makes your daily beauty bath more delightful than ever. Look for it in the familiar wrapper tomorrow. Here's your producer, William Keeley. Continuing with tonight's play, Singapore, starring Fred McMurray as Matt Gordon and Ava Gardner as Linda Graham. Our curtain rises on the third act. <laughs> News of Linda's disappearance has sent Matt Gordon directly to the antique shop of Mr. Maribus. But if Linda has vanished, so have Mr. Maribus and Sasha. In desperation, Matt begins a search of the Singapore waterfront. Meanwhile, Commissioner Hewitt's returned to his office. I'm sorry, Van Leiden, no sign of your wife as yet. And what about Gordon? Why didn't you arrest him? Because I don't think he knows where your wife is. But he's a criminal, a smuggler. He's a gambler. He smuggled because he loves the risk. Making a fool out of me is an added incentive. Well, if you can't get the truth out of him, I will. In my opinion, he's as anxious to find your wife as we are. Did he tell you why Anne went to see him today? No, but I can guess. Commissioner. Oh, yes. Come in, Tolson. Oh, Mr. Chin is with me, sir. He says he sold a schooner to Matt Gordon two days ago. Mr. Chin? Good evening, sir. About that schooner. Did Gordon give you any reason for buying it? No, sir. I asked him if he was going after Copra again, and he said no. Was that all? He did make a joke. He said the sea was a good place to get one's health back. I said he didn't look sick, and he said he wasn't. There. There you have it, Hewitt. Anne's health. Her mental health. What else could he have meant? And you tell me he's not involved in this? Tolson. Yes, sir. Bring Gordon in. About time. If he's not at the hotel, send out a general order. Yes, sir. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, Mr. Gordon. Well, 
Long time, not had the pleasure. Yeah, I've been away. Oh, uh, you come here to gamble. Plenty game downstairs. Come, I'll show you. No, I just thought you might be able to help me, Jimmy. Uh, Has Sasha Bada been around? Him? Uh, he does not come here anymore. Now he has place of his own. Um, Macau Cabaret, Sunflower Street. His own place, huh? Ah. Well, he's coming up in the world. Thanks, Jimmy. Good evening, monsieur. Who are you? I'm the manager. The waiter said you wish to see me. I want to see Sasha Barter. Mr. Barter is not in. Then I'll wait. It's quite possible he will not come at all tonight. I'll take a chance. What are those rooms up there off the balcony? Private dining rooms, monsieur. All of them? And the office of Monsieur Barter. I'll wait in his office then. It's quiet. What do you want? Someone is here looking for Sasha. Gordon? Yes, he's in the office. Go downstairs and stay there. I have no wish to kill you, Mrs. Van Leiden. But believe me, if necessary, I will. I would delete him if I were you, madame. Where are the pearls? Where did Gordon hide them? I've told you a hundred times. I don't know. Where are they? I can't remember. I can't remember anything. Where did he get the pearls for this necklace she gave you? But I... Told you, I've never seen that necklace before. You're lying. You were in this room that night five years ago. The night he gave it to you. I don't remember. I beg of you to start remembering soon, or you won't ever be able to remember anything. I think the young lady is loyal to her friend. Let us see if her friend will be loyal to her. But he's here? He's here. Oh, I'm sorry, dear lady, but as they say in your country, business is business. Lock her in, Sasha. I'll join you and Mr. Gordon shortly. Mr. Gordon. Well, I'm delighted. Skip the preliminaries, Sasha. You know why I'm here. To bring the pearls, perhaps? Mr. Moravis always said you would listen to reason. You smell good, Sasha, but you're not very bright. You're not very bright and not very fast. <laughs> What was the idea of the gun, Sasha? What, what do you want? I want you to talk. I want my share. What share? The share of the pearls you stole. Don't try to tell me you didn't. Oh, but I didn't, Mr. Gordon. Really, I didn't. Won't you turn around, Mr. Gordon? I'd hate to shoot you in the back. Yeah, I, uh, I see your point. Pick up your gun, Sasha. <laughs> Sasha. Now, what was the meaning of that? He hit me. I let hit him. Us, let us be sensible, Sasha. Uh, Mr. Gordon, what makes you think we have the pearls? All right. If you want to play games, you got them out of my room where I had them hidden. Well, you can keep them, but all I want is my cut. I'd gladly pay you, but unfortunately, we have no pearls. You still have them, or someone else has them. No one else knew where they were except one person, and she... Yes. And she... And she what? Nothing. You're overly chivalrous. But many gentlemen make the same mistake of trusting the uh, lady of the moment. Yes. Yes, there was a girl. She was scared to death when I ran into her again. And only this afternoon she came to find out if I was suspicious of anything. Oh, Sasha's not the only fool in this room. Self-recrimination will get neither of us anywhere. Yeah, but I'll find her, see? I'll show her who's so stupid. The lady is here, Mr. Gordon. She's here? I cut out the kidding. I'm, I'm not in the mood. Mm, you're a difficult man to convince. Come with me. Come along, Sasha. Mrs. Van Leiden, eh? Well, you're smarter than I thought, more of us. They keep asking me about pearls. What do they want of me? What do they want of you? <laughs> How long has she been giving you this, more of us? Too long. I'll get the truth out of her. Just leave me alone with her. I prefer to watch, Mr. Gordon. All right. All right, come on, baby, spill it. So you wanted the pearls for yourself, huh? Didn't you even cut in your husband? Oh, please. Do I have to beat it out of you? I don't want it, but you're asking for it. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Give me your gun, Morris. Oh, oh, no, no, I, uh, this I keep, Mr. Gordon. Then it looks as if I'll have to use my arm. <laughs> Mr. 
here with her. He's here. Gordon is here with Mrs. Van Leiden. Gordon? She's been hurt. Uh, she's unconscious. Tolson, give him a hand. Well, what's happened? There was Anne. A... Anne, darling. There was some shooting. A bullet grazed her head. I, I guess I caught one, too. Caught a Dr. Van Leiden. Where did you find her? You've got a police report. Marcia and... Uh, more of us and Sasha. If you don't mind, I'd... I'd like to wait around and see what the doctor has to say about it. What is it, doctor? Is she all right? She will be. Is she still unconscious? Oh, no, no. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Gordon, see that you keep that arm in a sling for a couple of weeks. Now, uh, about your wife, Mr. Van Leiden. Yes, doctor. She seems to be under some great emotional strain. Yes, I'm afraid she is. Well, there's nothing more I can do now. I'll stop by again in the morning. May I see her now? Yes, but I'd like her to rest. Before I go in, Mr. Gordon, I owe you an apology. Forget it, Van Leiden. Goodbye. Goodbye. Where is he, Mary? Matt! Matt, where is he? Anne, Anne, darling. The bomb! The bomb! Oh, oh look for him, Mingling. I... Oh. No, don't be frightened, darling. Oh, Michael. Everything's going to be all right, Anne. Oh, where's Matt? Matt Gordon. I've seen him again, haven't I? Yes. Where is he, Michael? He's gone. Oh, but I must see him. Oh, no. No, perhaps it's better this way. You love him, don't you? We'll go back to the plantation, Michael. Nothing will be any different. I'm so grateful to you. You've been wonderful to me. The best friend I've ever had. Gratitude? Friendship? <laughs> Everything but the one word I want to hear. And that's reserved for him. And you won't admit it because you don't want to hurt me. I wish I deserved it. Oh, but you do. No. No, for three years I've known all about you. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to lose you. Oh. What happened to me? It's not your fault. But I could have helped you and I didn't. That young doctor was on the plantation. He said he could cure you, but I sent him away. Do you still think I'm your best friend? Yes. And I'll try to prove it to you. There still may be time. Flight five, now ready at gate two. Flight five, now ready at gate two. Gerald, just look at poor Mr. Gordon. His arm in a sling and those dreadful customs men just tossing things out of his bag right and left. I'm sorry, this is just routine. I'm glad they're my bags, Mrs. Bellows, and not yours. But they didn't even touch ours. <gasps> Where are they? Our bags. Why, they're over there, aren't they? Oh, your luggage is inside, Mr. Bellows. The commissioner wanted to go over it himself. If they mess up those things of mine, I'll go straight to the American Council. They won't, Mrs. Bellows. I'll go in and see that they don't. Open them all, Tolson. We'll have to go through the lot of them. I can save you some trouble, Mr. Hewitt. The pearls are in a shoebox in the Gladstone bag. And just to make it worth your while, here. Well, the necklace, too. Yeah. More of us uh, gave it to me. Is this a confession or a declaration? That's up to you to decide. Final call. Flight five for Manila, Honolulu, and San Francisco. Your plane? That's also up to you. Have a good trip, Gordon. Tolson, see the bellows get the baggage. Yes, sir. You know, Hewitt, I'm sorry I'm leaving so soon. Just when I'm beginning to like you. you better get on that plane before I change my mind. We're turning back, Gerald. The plane's going back to the airport. Gerald, do something. Oh, fresh. For heaven's sake, a stewardess. Yes, sir? My wife insists that we're going back. Would you mind explaining to her that... But we are going back, sir. No reason for nervousness, ladies and gentlemen. We've been ordered back to the field. Well, what's going on here, Mr. Gordon? You had changed his mind, I guess. What's that? What's that? Nothing. Nothing at all. There it is, your plane, and here. 
passport and ticket. Oh, Michael. No, no scene, darling. Goodbye. Good luck. Matt, Matt, darling. Sorry to interrupt your flight, Mr. Gordon. Oh, I bet you are. What did that book of regulations say? A minimum term of ten years? This term's for life, Mr. Gordon. Now take her on board and get out of here. The curtain falls on Singapore and rises again on Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner who returned to the footlights for a well-earned curtain call. Incidentally, Fred, I understand you met Ava for the first time on the set of Singapore. That's right, Bill. It's one of the pleasant memories of the picture. That I can well understand. Uh, Fred, what's this about your going into farming in a big way? Yes, where is this farm I've heard so much about, Fred? Well, it's 65 miles north of San Francisco on the Russian River. We raise prunes and sheep, and uh, we have a registered herd of milking shorthorn. Uh, well, the cows, you know. <laughs> uh, how many heads? Oh, one to each cow. Uh, 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 strictly regulation, you know. Tail to balance and four legs, one in each corner. And you really get plenty of milk from this herd? Well, with meat prices the way they are today, all you have to do is give them a dirty look and they take a hint. <laughs> well, it sounds a lot easier than cattle ranching. Oh, it is, Ava. Joel McRae raises cattle for meat. He said it's just one big beef after another. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know Ava was a farm girl, weren't you, Ava? Yes, I was brought up on a farm bill back in North Carolina. Oh, is that where you get that wholesome country girl complexion, Ava? <laughs> or can we credit it to Lux Soap? Lux Soap gets the credit there, Bill. I use it faithfully for my complexion. I always have. Good for you, Ava. Well, Bill, uh, how about slipping us the news on next week's show? And good news it is with another fast-moving mystery from 20th Century Fox, The Dark Corner, starring from the original screen cast, Lucille Ball and Mark Stevens. That was a thrilling picture, Bill. Yes, and one combining intrigue, humor, and romance. A story packed with action and suspense. Your audience ought to eat it up, Bill. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Many thanks to both of you, and come back soon. Before we leave, may I remind you, as I do myself, that the precious liberties we take for granted in America are not ours by inalienable right. They are not a gift from nature, but something that we've fought and worked for through the years. Individual freedom. Let's never take that great American heritage for granted. For to continue to enjoy the freedom that we have today, we must be vigilant in its defense. We must exercise our powers of citizenship, our faith in liberty, to the extent that our free way of life will be a model for this troubled world. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lucille Ball and Mark Stevens in the dark corner. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Fred McMurray is soon to be seen in the Lasky McCune production for RKO, Miracle of the Bells. Ava Gardner appeared by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of Green Dolphin Street, starring Lana Turner and Van Heflin. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Johnstone as Hewitt, Ben Wright as Van Leiden. Jack Edwards, Jr. as Sasha, and Charlie Lung, Edmund McDonald, Joseph Bell, Regina Wallace, Alma Lawton, Herbert Rawlinson, Lal Chanmera, Jack Crucian, Norman Field, George Sorrell, Guy Kingsford, Lois Corbett, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, Reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Dark Corner with Lucille Ball and Mark Stevens. Sprite, when you bake and fry. Sprite, for your cake and pie. Sprite, if you're short and fine, rely on Sprite. For crispy, golden-crusted fried foods, deliciously tender and full-flavored, try Spry. You get no strange off flavors with pure all-vegetable Spry. And note... 
foods fried the spry way are just as digestible as baked or boiled. When you fry... Rely on spry. F-B-R-Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Dark Corner with Lucille Ball and Mark Stevens. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.